thank you so much for coming. Wonderful to be here. Um, gosh, listening to everybody speaking this morning, it was just like, yay, I agree. I can't believe it. It was just such a nice feeling. So um, when I thought about no addicts here, I don't know if anybody saw the Monty Python thing on telly the other day, right? So do you remember in The, uh, the Life of Brian where there's a stoning? And uh, he says, are there any women here? And they all go, no, 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 no. I'm like, are there any addicts here? No, 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 no. I've spoken to a few people already here today. And a couple of people have said, um, there's no addiction. I don't have mental health issues and there's no addiction. And I sort of think, come in here and lose the sanctuary of denial. I, my mother says to me, I would hate for you to be an after dinner speaker because you would just ruin my life. So I sit there <laughs> at dinners and people say, so what do you do? And I say, I'm a therapist. And then they say, oh, what area of therapy do you specialize in? And I'm like, you might want to finish that drink first. Um, and then, of course, I tell them I work in addiction. And they say, well, I don't usually drink this much. It's just been a busy week. And the person sitting next to them becomes extremely interesting. And uh, anyway, so I have no friends. So thank you so much for playing with me today. So I'm a clinical director and founder of Charter. I opened it in 2008. Uh, it's an outpatient center working with addiction. And apparently, when I opened it, I was told that that's not possible. You can't treat addiction in outpatient. Well, the answer to that is it depends when you pick it up, right? It depends. I believe that addiction operates on a continuum. And we all recognize this end of it, the sort of far-fighting end of chronic alcoholism, anorexia, whatever you would include in addiction. And I do have a list. I'm not big on slides, um, but we've got them to support uh, what's going on. So... Uh, Here's the far fighting end, but you don't just airdrop into chronic addiction. You don't just wake up one day an alcoholic. You must travel on this continuum, so I'm really interested in this. I should add that um, I'm also a recovering addict. How does that make you change about how you feel about me? The stigma of being a recovering addict. I mean, I was at, I do lots and lots of public speaking in schools, and I was at Down House, and one of the fathers at Down House, in the first 10 minutes when I said that, in a big parenting talk, he said, um, well, I'm not going to listen to you if you're an addict. And I thought, OK, you can leave. It's fine. I am a recovering addict. I came in in my early 20s. I'd uh, suffered the first signs of a stroke. That didn't get me into treatment. And eventually, I got into treatment. And when I was in there, coming from a world of television, when I came in there, I just got something, and I thought, wow, I love this world. And what I found now is I absolutely love the work I do. I love the work I do. Because all I have to do is in big, be in good shape and be brave enough to be honest with you. That's my job, really, plus all the training and so on. So when I work with the CEOs from the city, when I work with... Um, you know, children of the CEOs from the city, and they come in and they're used to pathologizing the problem, and the door is shut. I'm actually allowed to say, let's have a look at the family dynamic, let's have a look at what's, what's going on. Because you can control the symptom, which is what I think the drugs and alcohol, etc., is, are. I'm interested in turning off the gas, I'm interested in stopping fueling the kind of negative coping mechanisms. And if you think about social groups, your original social group is your family, your second social group is your school, and your third social group is at work. So the patterns you pick up at home are the patterns you're going to perpetuate um, in, in, the, in the workplace. So when we're looking at addiction, it's really important to think about what it is. And the DSM, the Diagnostic, or Diagnostic Statisticians Manual, has got a list of what uh, a kind of definition of what addiction is. And I'm going to give you an alternative uh, definition in just a moment. I am also, I would add, in my own kind of journey. So I come in as somebody who suffers from addiction. And when people say, what were you addicted to? My answer to that is, it's the wrong question. It's more, why did I feel like that about myself, that I had to compensate in such self-destructive ways over and over again? I had two suicide attempts, and one of them was when I was in early recovery. And I'm a mother of three children. 
Now, I'm a single mother of three children. I'm a recently divorced single mother of three children. I run my own business. I run charter. My husband went back to Australia, disappeared there for 18 months. There was no money, no support, no nothing at all from him. So I'm a divorced, single mother, recovering addict, running a business with no background of kind of, you know, everybody else there. I also have rheumatoid arthritis and in 2006 was laid up in bed for a year and was told, nine months actually, was told I probably wouldn't walk again and was being sort of measured up for a wheelchair. And, uh, and earlier this year I had a cancer scare. So it's very interesting to think that actually I feel really happy. I'm happy, I'm resilient in that problems happen, things happen. They will always happen. Our stresses will happen in our lives. We will get that bad news will happen in our lives. And sometimes the good things will happen in our lives. But if I actually believe I am an addict, if I think I am those things, it's a much bigger job trying to kind of handle it. If I take it on as being me, it's not. It's just what I've got to deal with. So when I think about my rheumatoid arthritis, interestingly, I think that I have to inject myself every other week and I have to take chemotherapy meds every single week. And if I don't do those things, I will seize up. Equally as an addict in recovery, there are a number of things that I have to do and I call them the vertebrae on a daily and weekly basis. And I have gone from being the veritable black sheep of the family to, as my mother recently put it, the most sensible one around here. Surely there must be something you want to drink, Mandy. Mum, honestly, I'm all right. Gosh, you make things terribly hard for yourself. No, honestly, really, I'm really happy. What? On water? Yes, Mum, we'll go to that later. It's an interesting one, how people's projections are getting onto me. How comfortable are you going to the pub with somebody who doesn't drink? I certainly know that when I was taking drugs and drinking, the last person I wanted to go to the pub with was somebody who didn't drink because I felt embarrassed. I want to take hostages. I want to go to the pub with people who are going to hang out with me and do exactly the same thing as me so I don't feel weird and I don't feel odd, right? So I need a few hostages and a few players. And then I treat it, create a little culture that says this is what we do. And then we have what's known as in-group, out-group psychology. This is what we do, and if you're not doing it, there's something wrong with you. So I now reinforce the brand that what I am doing is kind of cool or got kudos or I'm a player or I'm that kind of person, right? So there's some weird peer pressure going on that if you can't go out and get shit-faced five days a week, there's something wrong with you. I used to lead that gang. I used to lead that gang. And I'm very, very sorry. This is my eternal living amend is trying to talk to people about what's going on. So just so I don't go too far off piste. Using something repeatedly to fix how you feel to the detriment of yourself. Right, nothing wrong with putting up an umbrella if it's raining, right? I get that, I get that. I want to protect myself from the rain. But if you're anything like me, you put the umbrella up to protect yourself from the rain and then you go, well, might as well leave it up just in case it rains. And then you kind of get comfy and you keep it there and you never have the sunshine and you never have the wind and you never have the anything. And then you become so insulated by this, you're actually frightened of taking it down. And someone who cares about you says, why are you walking around with that umbrella? And I feel shame and now I hate you for challenging my umbrella. And then you make me feel bad for having my umbrella. So I try to get someone to, to rescue me from that. And then you try to wrestle it out of my hands. Mandy, please put the umbrella down and I will fight you for it. It's very difficult tackling somebody's addiction if what they're using it for is to protect themselves against something they've forgotten. I don't even really know I've got it up anymore. But then I take it down and everybody goes, yay, well done, look at you. You've stopped drinking, isn't that fantastic? And I'm like, no, I feel naked. I'm terrified now. The early stages of getting clean and sober or whatever your addiction is, is actually terror. Because the real key about all of this is that the thing that drives addiction is a defense against being vulnerable. That's the key. If I, I don't believe that I want you, I don't believe that if you knew me, you would like me. So what I do is I create versions of myself to introduce you to. And then when you like that version of myself, I feel pressured to maintain it. The whole concept 
of addiction per se is a defense against vulnerability. So when we're out there listening to these people about, um, you know, I'm admitting that I'm doing, that I have uh, mental health problems or mental health issues, and then the fear and the shame that comes with it, I just think, gosh, you know, that's so sad because you have no reason to feel fear and shame because you are owning actually who and what you are right here, right now. What other people think of you is not your business. And quite often people look through their subjective lens at you anyway. And I think that everything about defending against vulnerability, I'm going to come back to this slide in a minute, means all the other things then play out. But just to jump back to so these are the manifestations. These are the symptoms of addiction. It's really interesting. We look at drugs, alcohol. I put screens there because I do masses of work around screen work and screens with children and so on. And we know that the neural pathways are the same for drugs and alcohol as for screens. So if you teach a child how to self-regulate properly around technology, you've got one in the bank for when they hit the big guns that are drugs and alcohol. If your child is someone who believes that you are the problem between them and their technology, if they're on their gaming device and you come in and you come off that, in a minute, will you come off that thing? I am sick to death of this. They just think, mum's got a problem. Mum's really agitated. They don't realise that the problem is happening between them and this technology. And unregulated, if they don't realise that gosh, this thing's affecting me like that and I need to stop or I need to look at the effect this has on me later, when they hit drugs and alcohol, they won't feel themselves getting drunk. It's so common with an alcoholic. They don't feel themselves getting drunk. So what's happening? They're dissociating. They're not present. They take the first drink to fix how they feel. I don't feel good enough. I feel funnier when I'm drinking. It just makes me feel a bit more comfortable. It allows me to connect. I mean, you pick your rhetoric. But I use that substance for something. Now, if you're anything like me, you then dissociate. And then all of us are out of here with our passports going to France on a massive mission. And I got no idea why are these people coming? What are we doing? It's extraordinary, the stories that people tell. And I hear all the things that we're hearing up there, I hear these day in, day out. And one of the reasons that I can continue to do what I do and love do what I, doing what I do, and I have three television um, series on therapy, I've got a book coming out called Proactive Parenting, I'm doing talks all the time. If any of this actually interests you a lot, I do a talk that covers the entire model, which takes 90 minutes, um, and they happen regularly in London. So if you're interested, by all means, contact my organization. So the drugs and the alcohol and the screens are connected, and it's about self-regulation. The bad guy is not the alcohol. If you like, the problem is I don't, I have a shame-based process, we'll come to that on the other screen, and therefore I need to self-medicate. I need something between me and the outside world to filter me and to filter you to defend against my vulnerability. The eating disorders, sex and love addiction, pejorative phrase, unfortunately, it's what out there, and money, these things always go in a triad. When I have somebody who has an eating disorder, so if it's, let's just very simply say anorexia, bulimia, and overeating. Anorexia, the psychopathology of anorexia, is finding safety in not needing. Sure, it's about the food, but I promise you, treatment, effective treatment, is helping somebody to fracture the isolation of being so self-reliant that they feel safe not letting anybody in and starting to let somebody in, which is, if you like, the attachment and intimacy disorder. And quite often, people with eating disorders struggle, struggle with money, because all three are a form of nourishment. Food, physical nourishment, attachment and intimacy is emotional nourishment, and obviously money is the form that we use uh, in order to access these things. So they are always all distorted. So you, if you have somebody you're worried about in your organization who has an eating disorder, I promise you there will be disturbed relationships there and there will be something about a pattern, a distorted relationship with money as well. And if somebody is a dyed-in-the-wool eating disorder, if they are anorexic, they will know more about food than you do. So don't bother attacking it from that angle. Go via the attachment intimacy stuff. Try to connect. So the anorexic, you will, they will force you in to rescue them because they'll be in that space where they don't need and they will attract rescue. The bulimic will take and then throw up. So they'll like relationship, but there'll be drama after drama after drama. And they will take in sustenance, but they can't keep it. They can't let it nourish them. 
and then uh, the overeater has no idea what is satisfaction. I'm often interested in the overeating disorder because quite often it's attached to codependency. Now, when you're looking at HR departments, when you're looking at therapists, the NHS, we are looking possibly at a culture of using people professionally whose childhood wounding was to say, naught to six, don't worry about me, let's worry about you. No, 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 I'm all right, I'll be a good girl. And I discover as a young child that if I learn how to prop up mum or dad or my brother, that somebody says, oh, how lovely to have you here, aren't you a good girl, where would I be without you? And I get reinforced for that. So then I go into primary school and I'm the good girl, I do tidy up time, and everybody says, the teachers say, oh, she's a joy to have in the classroom. I gravitate to secondary school, and guess what? All my friends are the self-harmers and the people who are messed up in some way. Why? Because I know how to be around those people. And when I fall in love, I fall in love with a high-maintenance individual because I know how to be around someone like that. And when I go to work, I am given the job in the school. I'm the person that's go-to for the troubled child. And at work, I'm in HR. It's very, very important, if I can speak non-clinically for a moment, for somebody who recognizes themselves as codependent, and I mean it profoundly, if you recognize yourself as codependent, the one thing you have to learn to do is to give yourself a cuddle. Weird as it might sound, that is the hardest thing for somebody who is codependent to do. If you don't, two things happen, one, you have a tremendous asset that is caring and empathy. But the one person who doesn't benefit is you. So not only is your giving hypocritical, you are high risk of burnout. And I think it is incredibly important for us to access those people possibly who were hurt in those early childhood years by some kind of distorted family dynamic that set them up to be needless and wantless and enormously uh, empathetic towards other people in their, in their working and uh, home lives, that they then challenge that original wounding and say, okay, I am empathetic, but I must also benefit. So that what I give to you, the people I work with, is unconditional help. If it is my job to make you feel better, when you are crying and I come and comfort you, you will feel obliged to feel better. Woe betide the person who's troubled, who doesn't feel better if a codependent has given them some care. In order for somebody to continue to feel upset and for you to be a support, you need to be able to know that you just help because you love it irrespective of how the other person responds in many ways. You are only responsible for you. It's interesting because, as a quick aside, um, I am a child of a codependent. And my mum and my dad divorced. And I would go and see her and knock on the door. And my mum would say, come in, come in, come in. Hello, Mandy, would you like a cup of tea? No, Mum, I've only got 10 minutes. No, no, let me get you a cup of tea. No, Mum, honestly, I've only got five minutes. It won't take me a minute. Let me get you a cup of tea. So she goes, How would you like your tea? Mum, I don't want a tea. Do you want me to leave a tea bag in? Mum, I don't really care. Is this how you like it? Is this how you like it? Mum, I don't care. Would you like some cake? No, I don't want any cake. Won't take me a minute. Let me get you some cake. She, <laughs> she comes in. I go, I don't want any cake. All right then, no, mum, I'll have it. No, no, it's all right. I'll have it. I'll take it and I'll put it down. And she'll come and sit there and say, I've been very worried about you, Mandy. <laughs> and the tragedy is, do you have any idea what it's like to grow up with a mum or a parent who doesn't have the self-esteem to believe that her daughter comes to see her so she has to put tea and cake in the way? And I felt like a monster for feeling so angry about it. And then I realized it's because I love you and I want a relationship with you. But my mum's greatest challenge was to actually believe that. Two words I would say to you if you suffer from codependency, you matter, full stop. And if you want to give, 
Give from a digested love position. Give from a place of good self-care. Because not to, as I say, means the recipient is obliged. Gambling, I'm just going to touch on because lots of people talk about gambling in association with the city. And uh, the real cure, if you like, the key to treating gambling is the same gender, the competitive same gender relationship. Gambling is about not winning or losing, it's about fighting the machine. And the original machine, in brief, is your same gender parent. In terms of modeled behavior, we take our self-identity from our same gender older, sibling or parent. And we take how we relate into the world from opposite gender and older. We always evolve upwards. And gambling, there is always, in all my clinical practice, there is a competitive relationship with same gender parent. So it's great if you pick up on someone who is struggling from this condition, but until they work on their same gender parent stuff, they will relapse. So I don't believe that addiction is a chronic relapsing condition, which is interesting and doesn't make me particularly popular with all my peers, my professional peers, because I think it depends on where you focus your attention. So when I came into recovery, and I was thinking about going to do all these school talks and talking about addiction and talking about all of this. I was thinking, wow, imagine if I could get a model together that I could take into schools and do teacher training and all those sorts of things and in the workplace and talk about the end of the scale that I mentioned of the continuum. This bit, not this bit. We've all got our substance. I mean, I run a business. You've got your substance abuse policies and so on at this end, right? But, but then you're firefighting then you're managing someone who has got a critical condition and they will need treatment. But what's it like to get these people in? So I wrote a program and I've developed a model and it's coming out in a book next year called Proactive Parenting. And it's about this and it's about this. Now the difficulty of that model is that these people don't think they're bad enough to access therapy, right? These people can't deny it. These people don't think they're bad enough. So we need to stop thinking about, am I bad enough to go to therapy? And we need to start thinking about, how could I benefit? I don't have to go in there saying, oh, these are all the bits that are broken. It's saying, do you know what? I come into therapy not out of despair. I come in out of hope. What can you add? Here's my family of origin stuff. I'm a born hero child. I'm needless and wantless. I'm self-reliant, a little bit insecure, always trying to keep it together, always trying to control everything. I've got an awful feeling I'm heading for burnout. Can you help me out before it happens? I'm like, yay, fantastic. There is masses we can do. But to get someone to do that, first they have to see therapy as they're threatening, and second they have to know that they're gonna get answers. I'm not into 18 months of psychotherapy. I like six, eight sessions. Get in there, do what I call emotional chiropractic, and then it's up to you to do the physio. But this is all about your relationship with vulnerability. And then you therefore have a very busy mind. You're constantly guessing and second guessing. Uh, you're compulsive, so you do things on a whim, you do things according to how you feel, and there's masses and masses of um, shoulds and if onlys. The stuff in the brackets, by the way, is the kind of answers rather than the qualification of what the phrase says. Resentment is a killer. It's when somebody gets into a dedicated victim space, they're very, very difficult to help. Once someone says, no, you don't understand, and it's very difficult for me, and yes, you know, why would you say that to me? And all of that, they are very difficult. You want to keep people out of resentment, which means you need to catch them at the shoulds and the if onlys, the expectation stage, where there's a huge amount of wishful thinking. Not being in the now, altering the facts, so denial is justifying, generalizing, universalizing, minimizing, exaggerating, whatever. Taking the fact and turning it into something else. This shame base, there is something wrong with me. I did a TEDx talk uh, recently, and uh, because of things that had happened, I didn't have any slides, and I thought, I'll write something when I get there, and I was the first person on. They went, great, you're here, and I was like, oh, okay. If you want to watch it, it is 19, 17 minutes of stream of consciousness, and I went straight to shame-based process. I don't think any of you are gonna like me, and there's this TEDx talk, which is just straight from the heart. And, uh, and actually, it just completely counters this concept of shame. If I am genuinely frightened of telling you who I am, and, and, and I allow that to get in the way, 
a very important damaging thing happens, which is, I believe, my own press. So every time I don't tell you who I am as a result of your invitation, um, I damn myself. There's a little Mandy standing there going, oh, let's talk to them. And it's me saying, no, be quiet, they won't like you. My relationship with myself is damaged. I have to say, yes, come on, let's just go and say hello. I need to learn how to take her hand and say to her, we're going to go and talk. And I have my own history in my childhood, like many of us do. But you can't remain a victim of your childhood for the rest of your life. And I think it's really important that we as adults learn to collect those parts of ourselves and perhaps talk about it. So that will fracture the isolation. When I was, um, so, so just to talk about, I think probably the most important thing up here that I would say is this obsession one. There's this 90 second mindfulness pattern that I ask everyone I ever meet to do, and it's three times a day for 90 seconds. So all I'm asking you for is four and a half minutes. <laughs> um, go to the loo, sit on the loo seat, put your hands on the tops of your thighs, sit there, put your alarm on 90 seconds on your phone, shut your eyes and just feel the breath from your nose to the top lip, somewhere here. And every time your mind wanders, just bring it back. Literally, that's it. Don't think about anything. Just... That's it. Now, pretty much everyone I've spoken to about this tells me afterwards, I have to tell you something, Mandy. I had to check my phone and just to check I'd set the alarm right. And it's always around 50, 55 seconds. And they're like, oh my God, I really can't tolerate sitting for a minute and a half. Uh, just, just giving my head a moment. Notice that. You practice that discipline. Over two week period, you will find that what you've done is you've created space between your busy mind and what you've got to do. I have a phenomenally busy life and I am in very good shape, surprisingly. And these are, this is one of the things that I practice religiously three times a day. The other thing I do is I ask myself how I feel every day when I wake up. It's now instinctive. And I know if I wake up in the morning and I've just got a resentment and I walk out the door and somebody's walking in front of me and my head's going, do you drive like that? I mean, honestly, what is your problem? You know, and then I get on the train and somebody goes, and I'm thinking, you've had time to make coffee this morning? You know, and all these things are in my head and I'm like, oh, hello, Mandy, yeah, great. So I know what I need to do. I absolutely concur with what's already been said, share. I know who my support network is and I contact them and I say, this is what's going on for me and they send me back a, ha, 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 you're going to have a tricky day then. You need to let go of your resentments. I don't even know what they're about. I don't care what they're about. Point is, they're polluting my pond right now and I need to be shot of them. So I will share about them. I go into Pret and I'll buy myself something and they'll say, how are you? And I'll say, I was really pissed off this morning, but do you know what? I'm feeling better. Thanks for asking. And by the time I get to work, someone says, how are you? I'm like, do you know what? I'm feeling really good. Because all day long, you happen to run into me and you ask me how I feel, I'm gonna tell you. Because I, as a recovering addict, struggle to get into my skin sometimes. And I need the world to help me get into step. Because when I'm out of step with the world, I'm out of step with myself. Much like everybody else, I agree. I think we reap what we sow. I really do. And when they're talking about top down and all that sort of stuff in organizations, I think it's so true. I went to a wonderful leadership breakfast recently in the city and we were talking about wolves and how wolves lead from the back. They don't lead from the front. And how the old days of the kind of aggressive leadership and you know, win, win, win and all this sort of stuff. And actually there's a look after the goose that lays the golden eggs. The golden eggs will take care of themselves. Look after the goose. You know, this is, this is what's, what's doing it. And I think, I think if we are fast with people and, um, you know, critical and critical of ourselves and critical of people, it's what comes back. And I think the culture of the organization is incredibly important. I echo what's already been said. I want to challenge the idea of a functional alcoholic. People talk about functional alcoholism, and I believe it's a complete oxymoron. They may well be drinking at work and they may well be brilliant at their job. And people say to me, he's so good at his job. You know, I know he's a big drinker, Mandy, but really he's not an alcoholic and I really don't want you taking him through the program. And I'm like, whoa, has anybody talked to his kids? Has anybody asked what he's like at home? Does he come home and behave like the CEO to his wife? By the way, is his wife bulimic and dating the PT instructor? I mean, it's like extraordinary how this stuff rocks out. 
I don't believe there is such a thing as a functioning alcoholic because if you're an alcoholic, you suffer from a distortion of all of those. So you cannot experience intimacy. Okay, you can't. You have one of those, you have all of those. You have 12 of those, you've got all of those, right? So exponentially, you might as well admit to all 16 of those because you've still only got... <laughs> Is asking for help a strength or a weakness? Really, 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 really. I'm heartened actually talking to people here today because um, I found myself wondering, is this just a tick box? Truthfully, on my way here, I was thinking, is it real? Do people really care? Do you really want to do something? Because I think that in admitting my weaknesses, I have gained respect and I feel stronger because I don't have to be, pretend to be anything I'm not which means I can just turn up and be me. And if that's what you've asked for, that's what you get. And if it isn't what you asked for, sorry about that. <laughs> but it's what I am, and I have no apology particularly to make for that. And we look at crisis management, and I run my team. All of it's crisis management. Everybody who turns up wants to kill themselves in some way or another, obliquely or actually. Every call is, please, can I have a session with you this week? I'm fully booked until February next year. I have a team of seven therapists. I've just dropped it from 25 because it was too much. We have to be able to crisis manage, which means we have to ask questions, be honest about the time frame, not panic, and don't think you are the solution. We have to work together and we have to give things the proper time. So if we can catch things earlier, less crisis. So prevention is better than cure. Mutually supportive policy, well, that's what's got to go up there, but actually that means let's all talk about it. I love the idea of people, of peers talking to each other, but what we have in my work is that we all sit in a room together, and I've gone in there, and I've cried. I've sat in there from seeing, you know, one of my clients or one of the families, and I've gone into supervision, and I've gone, oh, my God, you know, I just don't even know if I can do this. And I've cried, and we've all shared, and then I'm like, great, and then somebody else, then somebody else, somebody else, and we're back out there working again. The supervision forum, the clinical supervision forum, is an extraordinary forum because it is group therapy with peers and possibly with a clinician there. So you don't go deep, you don't go into your family of origin trauma, but you do have an opportunity to touch on how you feel and talk about it in the context of your peers so that over a year, it's no longer trying to deal with the crisis of the backlog. There is a culture of talking. And more and more, law firms in particular, I'm finding, are implementing supervision into their working practice, and I'm providing some of it. I think it's a really interesting um, movement from just being in the clinician's world and placing it into the corporate world. Patterns we've talked about. Onward referral. Make sure you've got people you trust for the particular things that you need them to do. CBT is one thing, cognitive behavioral therapy. It will take the anxiety or whatever it is, ask about the thinking, and give you solutions. EMDR, eye movement desensitization regulation, will, will help you to quieten the frontal cortex, drop into the limbic region, and talk about things you can't even remember that you had, which is about turning off the gas. So CBT might control the symptoms, but then go the distance and turn off the gas. So I've talked about supervision. Now, this last one, here's a challenge for you. When I looked at all the companies that are here today, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if people weren't afraid of the 12-step fellowship program? AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Codependency Anonymous, Al-Anon for the families of, of where there has been an active addiction, Gamblers Anonymous, there's, there's an anonymous fellowship for pretty much all of those addictive processes. And they depend on a room for an hour and a half a week. And I know there's this thing about God in the 12-step program that people say it's a religious program. Do you know what? It started with two men saying, I can't get sober on my own. Do you want to help? Can you help me? I'll watch your back. You watch mine. Let's motivate each other. Let's talk about how we feel. And let's not pick up a drink no matter what, we're not going to pick up a drink. And I need to be able to chew your ears off to not pick up a drink. And then I can start that process of recovery once I've got rid of, if you like, the fixing symptom. So I thought, I wonder whether any of you would consider looking into opening a fellowship meeting in your building 
and allow there to be a proper culture of recovery. When I work with your employees and they come to me on their knees with their alcoholism and they do six weeks treatment or four weeks treatment because we're outpatient, we can then do two days a week and stuff so they can go back to work and be in treatment. And they say, I am terrified of going back to work because I have to drink as part of my job. Nobody will understand that I have to leave early to go to an eating disorders um, you know, fellowship meeting. And I find myself thinking, imagine if Overeaters Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, CODA, NA, any of those, one of those was in the basement of the building, in that room that you don't even use. Because we are used, we are used to going into kind of church halls and um, funny little rooms in the back end of nowhere. It would be an amazing thing to incorporate because truly then you are saying, not only do we recognize it exists, not only do we give you all the mentoring and the peer support that we can and all the individual support, but we also completely uh, subscribe to the idea that actually the 12-step fellowship works best for most. It's an anonymous, free organization that is self-sustaining. Why not use that as well? I'm enormously grateful and very privileged to be here. Thank you so much for attending and I really hope you found it useful. Does anybody want to ask anything? Yes. You kind of hear the phrase, a phrase uh, addictive personality. And uh, when you have a list of addictions, you have sort of the traditional vices of them, of things like exercise, which is often the feeling of the state, which is a good thing for medication. What's your view on such a thing as addictive personality? Um, I would say two things. One is exercise isn't necessarily bad, but if you use exercise to purge emotion, and I know a lot of people in the city that I work with who will religiously exercise to get rid of feelings so they turn up perfect. And uh, the minute they hurt their leg on the ski slope, all the anger comes up and the depression and blah. Anyway, so happy to talk about that another time. Um, the addictive uh, personality thing. No, I don't think somebody is born with an addictive personality. I would say more on the nature uh, more on the nurture than the nature side, because I think that people can be born into an environment and there's a massive amount you can do to uh, reinforce coping mechanisms or not. But I think that there are roles within the family and there are particular things that happen in family setting that predispose somebody to need to self-medicate later. And I think that naively we look at that as if it were an addictive personality. Thank yeah. you, Mandy. I'm afraid we've run out of time in this session. Fine. Um, I'm sure you're going to be around for the rest of the day, and yes. maybe people could ask questions directly, maybe across lunchtime. Uh, the next session starts in this room in about two minutes' time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>